I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and here today with me is John Fennick, Portfolio Manager and Consultant at Fennick Consulting. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, of course, Charlotte. Nice to see you again. Really good to have you on. And as usual, we have a lot to talk about. You've just returned from Beaver Creek as well as the Denver Gold Forum. You're the first person I've talked to who's, who's been to both of them. So I'm hoping you can first spend a little bit of time talking about each of them, your takeaways and your sense of the sentiment at those two events. Sure. Um, so Beaver Creek is the largest junior mining conference in the U.S. and Denver Gold would be the largest for the big cap names in the U.S. And they literally are separated by about a day and a half to two days. Um, they always are at the same time of year. So roughly, you know, September 12th through 15th for the first and then September 17th or 20 for Denver. So, you know, I, I spend the entire time out, uh, on the road during those eight or nine days. And we met with 38 different CEOs formally during that time period. Um, but then, gosh, you know, at cocktail hours in the hallways, I mean, all in probably 55 to 60 CEOs. And I wrote up some of that in my newsletter, the Fennec Commodities Report, uh, this past weekend for subscribers, but also I'll do a double issue and do another, you know, write up later this month when I can get my footing. But uh, it's been difficult to be away for that long, uh, feeling a bit under the weather with so many planes and, and so much travel. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the vibe at Precious Metal Summit was very positive. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be the first speaker at the conference. Um, on September 12th, and the topic was energy transition. Um, the coordinators, uh, Misha and Jessica Leventhal, uh, thought it would be a great idea to put a full dedicated day just to companies in the energy transition, you know, subsector, if you will. So that would cover copper, uranium, lithium, et cetera. So it was really awesome to see a bunch of new CEOs, you know, able to attend the conference. Um, and then we went on through the conference, um, just a jam packed schedule. I had five clients of mine, uh, attend, so they were mirroring me through a bunch of meetings. It was really great. And, um, you know, then we ended up, um, moving on to Denver gold and the, and the mood at Denver gold is slightly different because it's held in a, an iconic hotel, the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. And it's really, um, a large conference hall, like huge. And so you've got the jumbotrons and. You know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, the mining hall of famers, you know, kind of roaming around, but the vibe is a little bit more, you know, dialed down. It's, 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 you know, not as, uh, electric, I would say in terms of the chemistry, uh, there, but nonetheless, I would say the overall theme is, uh, companies are tightening their belts. I would say they're, they're, they're aware that, you know, spend is very important here. You know, you've seen a number of companies having to raise money this year and to a difficult market. So companies are, you know, trying to conserve cash, which I think is very prudent. And um, uh, in fact, sometimes just not drill at all right now, right? Because why drill if the you're an explore co if the comp if the market is not rewarding you for good results? There's been plenty of good results, but a lot of times CEOs walk away very disappointed because they think, you know, this is going to be what gets the stock moving. And of course it's sort of met with blah kind of response from the retail market. So, um, you know, I've encouraged them to just keep, you know, a good, uh, look, you know, at their cash balance, um, and make sure that they can try to get into next year without having to do a raise at a difficult time of year like this. Um, and, um, you know, just try to live to fight another day. And I think that that day is coming next year. Next year, I think looks really good. Uh, the sentiment is that, you know, we've been, in a down market now, uh, you know, pr probably arguably for three years and a month, you know, August of 2020 being the high. So it's only a matter of time before we see some type of sector rotation. And I think we're there probably next year. Yeah, I think attending events like that can help give an idea of where we're at in the current cycle. So really interesting to hear your thoughts there on on gold and what you saw at those events. On the note of conferences, you know, you're mentioning you did a talk on the energy transition at a precious metals event and it went well and in fact it went so well that i believe you are going to be collaborating with uh, beaver creek runners to put on an energy transition event next year coming up in april so maybe you could share some details on that because that sounded quite interesting yeah um i think you know 
there's a void out there in the U.S. for a conference that would address energy transition, battery metals, critical minerals, et cetera. There's a lot of small conferences, but you know, Misha and Jessica at PreciousSummit.com have done a tremendous job of building Beaver Creek into a premier you know, conference over the years, and they have a waiting list of people, right? That means, you know, means companies waiting to get into that type of conference. So, you know, I said, geez, there's so many companies approaching me to try to get into your conference. Why not have a conference dedicated just for them? Copper, lithium, uranium, cobalt, et cetera. And they both looked at each other and, and it was like an aha moment. And, and, you know, four or five conversations later, they put together this great agenda for April 29 and 30 in Washington, DC, which is where I'm from. And, um, I can bring a lot of high net worth retail, I think to that event. Um, I've worked with a lot of financial advisors, as you know, on the East coast. So I think a lot of people would be happy to jump in an Uber or a short drive to see what I'm seeing, um, after following my work for a couple of decades, but may not do the same to get on two planes to uh bail or debt for right. So. I don't have that kind of draw. Um, I think I think uh, the conference should should really draw a lot of good uh, money, and that's and that's the kind of thing that I think CEOs are missing from certain conferences, not the ones we're talking about, but certain conferences just don't have the staying power. They have the same kind of people going back and to the conference over and over again, year over year. And if you're spending fifteen thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to attend, you know, as a company, you want something more than that out of the conference, right? You want to get in front of new clients to get, you know, more people into the, into your story. And so I think that's, that's the goal of one of the goals of what we're going to do there. And, um, I know that Misha and Jessica have partnered with a Northern miner, uh, Anthony Picaro and, and that group. And so it should be a really awesome event and, uh, I hope people will ask me more about it. Okay. Well, we'll be keeping an eye out for that one next year for sure. And so, you know, events, of course, those are important in the resource sector for getting information. Also important for due diligence is site visits. And over the summer, I believe you went to see Senate resources. So curious to hear about your takeaways from that, things that you learned, and and maybe a little bit about the importance of site visits. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a geologist by trade. I don't ever pretend to be. Um, I, I've, I've learned a lot over the years, and I feel like I can be pretty efficient at getting a good feel for whether or not a company is telling me the truth, especially if you go to the site, right? Um, Mark Brennan, the CEO in the States, uh, the ticker on Ascendant is ASDRF and in Canada, it's ASD. Um, Mark comes from a capital markets background like myself. So I always like to gravitate to people like that. We speak the same language. And and also it's, it's important, Charlotte, that when you get to this stage as an explore code moving to production in two years, which is very close, um, you need to start thinking about how am I going to fund this, right? And the market is starting to think about how are you going to fund this? Because they recently came out with their PFS uh, pre-feasibility study. And they basically said that they need X amount of dollars to put this you know, project to work. Well, you start doing the math and you're like, well, that's a lot of money. And so how is Mark going to do this? But Mark also runs Serato Gold, which is a CRDOF. And Mark has a lot of relationships with entities like Sprott and larger banks or mid-tier banks to where he can probably fund both Serato and Ascendants, not necessarily at the same time, but has those relationships, right? And that's super important when you're looking at you know uh, these little small mining companies is it something looks great on paper or they hit a couple of good drill holes. That's great. But what is the management like? Are they on the side of the investor? And I think Mark is absolutely that way, man. He is really, really uh, responsive. Every time I email him, it's like 24 hours. Even if that's not the answer, he's getting back to me. And I love that. His team internally is great as well. He's got a deep bench working for him in the office. And um, what I took away from the visit in Portugal two weeks ago was that that they don't have the same first uh, First Nations issues per se that maybe a Canadian junior might have or somewhere else in the world, right? Um, Portugal as a government is very supportive of mining. Um, and this particular project has um, won some, some accolades in the country of Portugal, which gives them kind of like accelerated, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So, you know, when you're going through the permitting process or construction process, it takes months, right? And so 
they're they're on the fast track is what I'm trying to get at. Um, they're with the Portuguese government. They're on the same side here, which is huge. Um, and when you look at the economics of the project, it's about a 14 year mine life. The first five years, they're going to mine gold and silver as it sits right now, right? But they they have plenty of other exploration opportunity, and so that might go into year six, seven, eight. But as we speak right now, you know, if they start production in Q4 of 2025, which is the goal, uh, two years from now, um, you know, think about them mining gold and silver in a much better price environment for gold and silver over five years. That's huge. Yeah. But then they have, you know, lead and zinc and other type of metals that they'll also be mining. So um, I was, you know, lucky enough to tour the, the project with the uh, president of the Portuguese operation. Joao and his mine manager and uh, man, they, these guys are, are really smart and have a plan in place. And this stock is trading at six and a half cents US. And I'm laughing because it's it's literally like, you know, half off or then some from just a few months ago. And it's largely because number one, there was a large seller out there. And number two, people are just going to sell Charlotte into an environment like this they don't do their due diligence and that's why site visits are important and look i understand most people can't get on a plane to portugal and go check something out but understand that this is the second project i visited in probably 40 or 50 invites so i don't get on planes either because i've got a little 10 year old daughter i love very much so i don't try to leave her as you know and, and just go travel across the world for no reason so that should give your listeners a little bit of a uh background as to what i think about it and you know I would encourage them to go to a Senate Resources website and, and just reach out to IR. Mike McAllister does a really good job there if you can't reach Mark. Okay, thank you for going into that. Yeah, I do think it is important to take a look at how what you can get out of a site visit that you might not get elsewhere. But of course, can't do it all the time. So good to hear about this one. So I also wanted to ask you, just check in about your summer activities. So we spoke, uh, I think, toward the beginning of the summer. And one of the things you were saying is that during these slow months, that's when you're doing your research, you're trying to position in stocks. So just wanted to check in and see what you ended up doing, how that ended up panning out for you. Sure. Um, July and August were pretty brutal, as I had anticipated. And um, you, you do get some very good values when other people are not paying attention, right? And uh, look, I, I wish I had more free time. Um, uh, I, I use periods of time when most people are away to take advantage of the market because this is an inefficient part of the market, right? Junior mining is not like large cap tech where there's people at the looking at Apple and Google all day long, right? Like this is a, a sector where you can really make some money if you pay attention when other people are not. And another period of time coming up would be December, right? You've got Thanksgiving in the US, you know, right around the end of November and then Christmas on the 25th, of course. In there, you get some really good deals because people will just get real frustrated, try to get some tax loss selling done, sell at any price, and we constantly buy in December. And then just assess things in the first half of the following year if we want to hold something you know, longer than that. you know, um, As I've said on your show before, we tend to hold core positions like Ascended for one to three years. We get the long-term cap gain or loss that way. Um, but, you know... We'll trade on the periphery as well. So if we see something that just looks out of place in December, we can pick it up and sell it in March. You know, I mean, that's how our performance is our performance. We don't, you know, we're not just buy and hold investors. Um, so getting back to, uh, you know, what I saw this summer, it's just a lot of short selling, a lot of uh, down ticking in our sector. Um, it's, it's very frustrating, right? I mean, I, I went to my broker dealer, who I won't name, but three or four different times this summer saying, hey, I've got an order out there at seven cents and, you know, Vortex Metals comes to mind, right? It printed 500 shares at 0 0.0469. And you can look it up. And it's like, well, how how is my order not filled with way more shares than that at seven cents, way higher than that? And the CEO doesn't know. I don't know. My broker dealer didn't know after a 42 minute call with three different people and you're just saying to yourself this down ticking is criminal you know it's it's permeating our sector and it's not fair i mean look you know i'm all for um you know a level playing field and i, I think most ceos would feel the same judge me on my assets not um you know on the chart down ticking on a 20 to arch rate 
you know, because as, as, a, as a technician myself, when you look at a chart like that, Charlie, and you say, well, gee, I wonder if that was on a lot of volume. It was not. It was on 500 shares, 500 times, you know, five cents, let's call it. It's 25 bucks. I mean, it's nothing. So, you know, it, it, you, it really pays sometimes to look at how much volume is being done at a certain price on any stock because many times, you know, uh, I, I've, I've seen probably 50 to 60 instances like this conservatively in the last six months where, you know, I'm out there on the bid um, getting passed over for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, and all I hear from, you know, my broker dealer is, oh, it's dark pools. It's market maker, this market maker, that they're not taking accountability for what's actually happening. So, you know, stay tuned on that. We should talk more about that in 2024, because I'm really considering trying to talk to some regulators in Canada about this. Uh, I mean, being that most of these companies are Canadian juniors, right? Where that's where they trade most of their volume to just see what's actually happening here. And I know a lot of investors you know, have my back on this topic. Yeah, that that's very interesting and definitely sounds incredibly frustrating for you to be going through. So continuing on on the note of what's going on with stocks in your portfolio. So as we usually do, usually we go over some of the names that we've talked about before. Uh, I know a lot of people had written in, were curious to hear an update on Golden Minerals, but we've talked about many other companies as well in the past month. So let me know let me know what you're seeing there yeah so golden minerals um basically in may came out with news saying that they were going to put out their their annual meeting i think around may 26 if i remember correctly and um they had you know gone to shareholders prior to that and said you know will you um vote for or you know allow us to do a you know reverse split in the future um, that reverse split was doable up to one for 25, which is pretty extreme. Um, the company elected to do that in June, uh, or May 29th, I think it was right afterwards. And, um, immediately when you do that type of, of, uh, a reverse, tra uh, we call it a rollback sometimes in the, in the industry, Charlotte, um, the shorts will start to swarm a stock because the, the share price of course goes up and then at a higher price. Uh, being that this is an NYSE light stock, it brought in some short selling, right? And at the same time, the company needed to raise some money because Rodeo, where they were producing in Mexico, uh, was coming to a close, right? The life of mine was ending in, in Q3 of this year. So their plan was to pivot to Valardena, which is a nearby project, way bigger, by the way. Um, they put out some really positive news, I think, in August about Valardena, uh, and did the same in September this month. But the market is now looking at the stock as sort of like, hey, you know, show me rather than I'm going to jump all over good news. Um, and so they're in that period right now where they raised a few million bucks in the summertime. They need a little bit more money to to, to green light Valardania. But all I can tell you is I've been, you know, in the stock, you know, uh, long and short, you know, going back short way many years ago. Um, and I remember getting surprised in 2015 when they basically popped on Bellardania's success. And that was the last time they went into production at this place in eight years ago. So um, will we see that same kind of pop again? I don't think so. I mean, that was sort of an outlier. But um, I think when you're starting to look at doing a few million ounces a year um, as a stock right now is trading somewhere around three to three and a half cents before the split. It's, it's about 65 cents now because of the split. Um, and you know, it's, it's just looking really interesting again, risk there because they still need some money. But I think if you look at, you know, the, I would encourage people to read the 10 Q read some of the reports on CDAR, because when you look at that or sec filings, um, you know, when you look at that stuff, they have um, uh, Santa Maria back from Fabled. Uh, Santa Maria was a Mexican um, project that Fabled had to give back to the company. So they've got that asset for sale. I think that's going to get done probably in the fourth quarter here. And that will fund a lot of the cash we're talking about. Okay, that was a, that was a really good update. Very extensive. Were there any other companies that you wanted to mention that you are looking at that have had news? Well, maybe they haven't had news within the last couple of months or news you're looking forward to. Sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe we can cycle through a few here in the, um, 
transition, energy transition space. Uh, I didn't mention any of these at the conference, so this will be uh, accretive for those that, that saw my presentation on PreciousSummit.com. Um, I spoke mostly about themes and ETFs uh, at that at that conference last week. Um, so copper, um, you know, I, I've been a copper bull now since May of 2020, and I've talked to a lot about copper stocks on your show, and, and a lot of them have done quite well. One that hasn't performed well yet is World Copper. Um, so WCUFF is the U.S. ticker. I will say, however, when you look at their two projects, one in Arizona, one in Chile, they are both advanced stage, meaning they both have PEAs, uh, preliminary economic assessments on them. And either of those projects here at nine and a half cents US is worth nine and a half cents US to me. I mean, you're getting the other project for free. And you've heard some of this kind of talk before, like, oh, wow, it's such a great value. But this really is a good value because these are two of the most prolific copper, you know, locations in the world, right? Chile is, is number one or number two overseas. And Arizona is number one in the states, right? So jurisdictionally, this is a really interesting stock to me. Um, another stock in the copper space we just alluded to earlier, Vortex Metals, um, that's VMSSF. I had dinner with them at Beaver Creek, so it wasn't one of my 30-something meetings uh, because it was off calendar. But, uh, you know, these guys, you know, Michael and Vikas are really working hard to build a really good copper junior, and they built uh, a, a relationship with a Chilean um, group uh, and it basically, uh, if you look at the June or July news, it, it, they have, you know, they haven't closed that deal yet, but they were trying to bring on a third project in Chile to kind of diversify geographically, um, a bit from Mexico, but they both have a ton of experience. They put out some really good news a week ago that the market sort of missed, I think, you know, uh, with maybe just all the, the, the craziness at Beaver Creek and Denver gold going on and just markets being a little bit more, um, in flux here with the fed. But um, I really believe, you know, in people. And Michael Williams, for me, has been, um, you know, when you look at his track record of of Underworld and, and different things he's done in his 25-year-plus career, um, I try to align myself with people like that because when the turn comes, Charlotte, you want to be able to get information from someone like Michael or Vikas and have that lifeline, if you will, open to you. So, um, that's one I'm, I'm tracking and, and starting to buy a little bit in, in the copper space. In silver, I would say Guanajuato silver is really interesting right now. As a value manager, I'm looking for things on sale, right? And so Guanajuato, to me, has done a fantastic job of buying assets from Endeavor Silver, EXK, as well as Great Panther last year, uh, the former GPL, at rock bottom prices. And by rock bottom, I don't mean like half off. I mean like I think probably 20 cents on the dollar, maybe 15 cents on the dollar for assets, not in, not only the actual projects, but you know equipment, mill, et cetera. So with that, you have to refurbish you know some of that mindset, right? Because when an operator moves on, sometimes they don't leave it in the best of shape, right? Or it just needs an update. So they raised some money this summer, which did hurt the stock. Um, and that's to me, an opportunity because they did a raise, they got it out of the way, they've got some money now, they can operate and do what they need to do, but they're a developing silver producer, right? So I think people should take a second look at GS uh, VRF because it's trading literally at 20 cents on the nose right now. It dipped into mid 18s, I think about a week ago, but it, it's getting kind of ridiculous considering the stock was over 40 cents at some point this year. Um, Let's pivot to lithium. I think, you know, lithium is the kind of hot subsector along with uranium this year to me. Um, and Spark Energy Minerals is one that caught my attention when I went to uh, see some CEOs in Vancouver in June. And uh, Peter Wilson is doing a really good job of putting regular news out if you look at their website. Um, but they're also, you know, looking at their, their cons. cons kind of like positioning themselves as a proximity play at the moment in Brazil. You've got some big players in Atlas and Sigma, you know, and, and when you look at where they have land and how large their package is, it's like ranked second or third in, in all of that area, uh, you know, of the world. And um, the stock is trading really, really low. Here. I, I mean, it is, um, gosh, I think it's 0.14, so 14 cents. Um, and... I don't know. I just think it's worth a flyer 
considering lithium is so hot and, and getting this kind of land takes a lot of months and years to acquire. So I think as, as that subsector of, of the commodity world starts to really take off again, people will be taking a second look at a company like Spark. Um, also, you know, in the uranium space, we, we mentioned uh, URA on your um, program before, which is the largest uh, ETF in the space. That's done extremely well. Uh, the uranium space continues to outperform just about everything in the commodity world this year. Um, nickel is an interesting area for me, and nickel is um, something I spoke about uh, at the conference last week. I think investors should take another look at Canadian Critical, which is RIINF, uh, CCMI in Canada. You know, Ian Bersons and I had dinner for the first time last week. Uh, we've talked, you know, for about three years, but because of COVID, that wasn't something we were able to do. And um, he's just a really sharp guy who understands that, he, you know, his back is a little bit against the wall. Let's be honest, the stock's at two cents. But I mean, the stock was trading at five cents all day long, not long ago. And he's just had a really big seller out there that just hasn't gone away. So we look at that and say, okay, you know, why would this seller exist? And sometimes it's simply because someone's got to get out, right? There may be a hedge fund that's experiencing losses in other parts of their portfolio and they're having to liquidate, right? I mean, so it's it's just an opportunity when you look at the fact that they have two projects in Bull River and Terry. Terry, they picked up for a song. I think the, the, the cost was about a million and a half Canadian total. They've already had, you know, interested parties knocking on the door um, there, but Bull River is the is the bigger monster of, of, of their portfolio, and um, you know they, they the overhang of the stock to me, Charlotte, is they have about a million one or a million two in debt. And anytime you see a company that's trading low with a debt balance, people start to think, okay, this this could go bankrupt. That's a logical thought. Um, personally, I I know who owns the debt, and I I know that. You know, in doing that due diligence, they're not a nefarious party necessarily. They're not going to be problematic. So I, I think that Ian and his team can figure things out. So I think the debt gets extinguished within three to six months, and then the stock will probably get a lift. Um, another name, um, trying to think, um, I'm trying to think of all the guys I, and the women I met there. Um, Greg Farron I met at Platinex, and Platinex is something we haven't talked about yet. Um, that's P A N X F. What's interesting about that is that it's it's not just nickel, it's it's PGMs like platinum, palladium, but it's also gold, and they have a royalty portfolio. So they've got three different projects they're working on. They also own some lithium land. I mean, they really own a lot of different things. Again, for a two cent stock, which is just it's just hard to believe when you're saying these things because it sounds like these things are all you know on the brink of going under, but they're not. When you look under the hood, they've got a clear plan there to advance you know, um, the PGM project first, and then probably find a creative way to do something with, you know, their lithium project as well as their royalty portfolio. So they've got a lot of things going on. Um, I like that as a value manager, because as, uh, we've talked about with transition metals before, when you have 20 or 30 different things going on, it really broadens your, your risk, right? I mean, it's not like you're one shop uh, that has one project in gold, and if gold doesn't do well, you're in trouble. You know, um, there's many ways for them to succeed there, and I think Greg will. Um, Greg used to be the CEO of Treasury Metals, uh, and um, yeah, with that, I think there's maybe oh yeah, so Tolerium is something that I wanted to mention real quick because it's um, a new stock for us. We just started a position about a month ago. First Tolerium is uh, FSTTF in the states. Um, Ty Dockerty has been in the business a long time. And, and I think, you know, the numbers I'm probably going to get slightly wrong here, but I know he had probably put between four and $10 million into a company, uh, sold it for 175 million. And, um, and then kind of just, you know, started this Tolarian business because it's the only, um, you know, not needing to financially start something else. Uh, cause he did quite well with that previous transaction, but was so competitive so interested in what's happening with this critical mineral it's it's ranked eighth or ninth on the critical mineral list um 60 of it is produced in china so there's a cool interview out there on youtube where chen lin who's a an iconic investor in in the mining space interviews ty i think people should check that out if you're interested 
But Chen, you know, being Chinese, is saying that China is not to be trusted with their tellurium. And if they were to stop production uh, or, you know, just, you know, stop exports or whatever, right, you're going to have a massive disruption. Uh, so this is the only publicly traded uh, uh, company in the tellurium space. They're, they have a project in Colorado and they have a project in Canada. So that's one that I'm getting much more interested in because, again, the share count isn't out of control. Um, Ty, as a CEO, invests a lot of his own personal money in the in the market alongside of us at inv as investors. Uh, so I really like that, and um, that pretty much wraps up what I'm seeing out there in in the energy transition area. Okay, I think we got a really good mix there of some names we've talked about before, some that we haven't. I'm going to tell you right now, I haven't heard about Tellurium for a long time, and I think that's the first time ever that anyone has ever mentioned it in one of our videos for YouTube. So I'm going to come back to you on that one in the future for sure once I reacclimate myself with that market. So stay tuned for that. Uh, as we wrap up, usually we start off by talking about the gold price. Today we're going to finish with the gold price because we need to touch on that at least a little bit. We had recently the latest Fed meeting, and it looks like we're heading into a higher for longer rate environment if we are going to believe what they're telling us. So for me, that would tell me that gold is probably going to stay in its holding pattern for some more time. But what do you make of the, the latest Fed meeting and, and what's coming for gold? Sure. So I'll take part of that first, the, the, the higher for longer piece. Um, you know, we've known each other for probably two and a half years and I was on Kitco March and, and June of last year. And, um, on those big widely you know, watched shows at conferences, I was telling people look, the fed means business. And I don't know when this hawkishness is going to go away, but you have to respect 75 basis point hikes. I mean, that is serious business. And as you can see now, Charlotte, fast forward a year and a half or so, and we're sitting at very you know high levels of interest rates which are affecting many areas of the economy not only companies but the consumer if you look at consumer confidence on on uh, september 15 big drop in consumer confidence and that's the third month in a row that u.s consumer confidence has dropped so i'm not saying the consumer is dead but i'm saying it's slowing and that to me sets up for a recession next year um so gold is going to do extremely well in that kind of environment because I think not only are people with big money looking at the possibility of a recession next year, Charlotte, but they're also saying what just happened in March. You know, we've talked about that on your show before with the financial crisis. And so those two kind of aspects for really high net worth people are like, okay, hey, look, I've made a lot of money in the broad stock market for the last 14 and a half years. My real estate has gone up exponentially. You know, um, maybe I should take some money off the table here and hedge my portfolio. And you hedge a portfolio by buying things like gold and silver, right? That will zig hopefully when the market zags. If you look at the price action on September 15th, when consumer confidence dipped, the broad market was down pretty considerably and gold, silver, and GDX were all up nice, um, really nicely. So that's the kind of price action we need to see more of, which is what we would call a sector rotation. You know money that's in technology, in biotech now, starting to move from those riskier sectors into something like metals and mining. Um, to ask you, as to answer your question, when we met at VRIC, um, I remember we were almost at the low there for the year uh, when we interviewed around 1800 and I said it would hold 1800, which it did. It propelled all the way, you know, over 2050, came within five or six bucks of an all time high. And now it's pulled back to 1920. Um, so in 1920, you know, I mean, it, I think, look, we, we traded for over four and a half months, I think, uh, over 1900 an ounce, which is insane this year. You know, I mean, that's allowing producers to really do a good job. And I don't think those numbers are fully out yet in terms of their earnings. So I think the next quarter for some of the miners that are producing may be pretty good. Um, but when you look at the gold price, as long as we hold 18, you know, 50, I would say that's very constructive. And if by doing that, we would be making what we call a higher low on the long-term chart, right? Because if you look at the the ascent of gold from say January of 16 to now, it's it's done this. It's like a series of higher lows. And that's exactly the kind of chart you want to see uh, if you're a technician. And um, 
I don't think anyone could argue gold's here to stay. I mean, we've we've seen a floor put on gold here um, over the the course of the last six months because of the financial crisis, in my opinion. Um, and then if you have any other outside events or you see the broad market start to turn over, which we're starting to see a little bit, right? You saw uh, the Fed, you know, on the 20th kind of disappoint the markets with their hawkish tone. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but 12 of the 19 members of the Fed were saying another rate hike this year. So that's sort of, you know, not what people were expecting. The market immediately tanked in the last two hours of trading. Really bad day on Thursday, the 21st. And today really struggled. I mean, it was trying to break out all day long on the 22nd here and then just sort of finished flat. So not a wonderful, you know, vote of confidence if you're in the camp that you're going to see higher, you know, higher highs here on the NASDAQ and the S&P this year. Okay. Okay. Good update on gold. Lots of points to keep in mind there as we're moving forward. I think we'll wrap it up there for now, although I'll put it back to you and ask if there's any final thoughts that you would want to leave investors with right now. I would say, like I say, pretty much every time we talk, Charlotte, you know, please, please come to me through, through the website or through email. I'm very accessible. I probably won't be as accessible next year when things really take off because I'm getting pulled in a lot of different directions. But for right now, I think, you know, whether it's me or someone else, you should make that proactive uh, attempt to reach out to, to to someone and just say, hey, I need some help with my portfolio in terms of uh, just some handholding, just to talk about things, you know, thematically or, you know, we don't we don't put buy, sells and holds on, on stocks any longer that we, you know, are no longer licensed in Charlotte, but we basically can help someone to say, look, you know, why are you still holding something that worked three years ago? A lot has, has changed, not for the positive with that particular stock. You might want to take a tax loss. It's it's up to you and your accountant, right? But but bo bottom line is, people need to stay in there if they're in certain names. I mean, um, I'll tell you one that we've talked about in your show before, Forum Energy. I know I've talked about that at least twice before. You know, the stock really performed poorly all year, and now just went up two hundred percent in the last month. Um, and this is, again, why you need to revisit the story, talk to the CEO, Rick Mazur, see what's going on. And if you had done that like I was doing, you would have bought more instead of selling at a really bad you know, point in time, right? And so that's the kind of stuff, whether it's me or another professional, or you know, just contact the CEO if you don't have the, the money to join up. But I think right now, whether it's our newsletter or our real-time you know, macro updates, we, we provide a lot of value for a small amount of money. Okay, I think that's a, a great place to wrap up on. So thank you so much for coming on to talk about what's going on in the precious metal space. Well, and other spaces as well. It was really good. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. Appreciate it. Of, of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is John Fennick with Fennick Consulting. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts. So leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.